back in Psalms 119. <clears throat> but um, I was actually going to go into why I love the Bible. But this afternoon, actually a little bit earlier today, I was, I was um, actually sitting and having my car washed. And I'd been reading some stuff and I went back in my Bible. And so I began to write down some things that I've been reading my own personal devotion so I went back to the office and I just kind of wrote down the rest of the things that the Lord was just kind of putting on my heart so I I just forgive me brother Anthony because I'm sure you don't put the outline up there I'm so sorry but I just want to be mindful to the Lord tonight I, I want you to turn your Bible to Matthew chapter number 14 I, I've been in this text for about two weeks now I'm you begin to read in Matthew chapter number 14, there's a lot of things. You see the Lord doing a whole lot. As a matter of fact, this is really a time of excitement. Uh, when you come down to about the middle part of this chapter, you're able to be able to see one of the greatest miracles that we know, of course, known as the Lord where he feeds the 5,000. And um, it's amazing what God can do. The story was there was a little boy that came, and he was, a, of course, a lad. The Bible says he don't have a name. That shows you that God, he ain't really worried about your name or who you are. If you'll just give whatever God's put in your hands, you give it back to God, God can use it for his honor and glory. You see that he fed the 5,000s, and then after he fed the 5,000, plus all the children and all the women that were there, there's a lot of a joy. There's a lot of excitement. Matter of fact, let's just read in verse number 19, and we'll go through this, this text together. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass, and he took five loaves and two fishes, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up the fragments that remained, twelve baskets full. And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men besides men, besides women and the children. So you see here that literally the Lord comes and these disciples trying to figure out how to be able to feed them. And of course, as we said, that no matter who you are, what your name is, if you'll just give whatever you've got to the Lord, God can use it for his honor and glory. But there's two sides of this. It's amazing because in verse number 19, I want you to notice what he says again. He says, and he commanded the multitude to what? To sit down. I want to say this. Sometimes God has a blessing for us, but we've got to position ourselves for God to bless us. I, I don't know why the Lord, I've, I've heard reasons why the Lord told them to sit down. I, I don't know biblically. But I would dare say that if there's something that God wants to do in your life, remember this even though that God wants to do it and God can do it, there still requires obedience on our behalf to receive whatever it is that God's trying to do in our life. The Bible says after this great excitement, though, this is where I've been for the past two days and just want to walk through it because what I've learned in my life is that Lord sometimes does some things. And just like right now in our church, I mean literally every single week somebody's joined the church. People's been baptized. I mean, I, I've never been able to say that in my Christian life. Every single week, all the way up to this point, except for January the 1st. And the only reason they didn't on January 1st is because for the Alan Barker was here. We would have had somebody joining on that day. So we would have had somebody joining every single Sunday. And it amazes me because it is a time of excitement. And I think to myself, Lord, I, I don't know what you're doing. I, I know that we have got ourselves out of the way. I know I have personally got myself out of the way. And, and you and I know that typically that is always the problem. It's us trying to get in the way of God. But when we get out of the way, then God is able to be able to do some things that we've never seen before. So you come through this season of your life and the Lord is blessing. And man, we see God baptizing and Lord, things happening, people getting saved. And man, new visitors coming in and, and people inviting people and new converts. And I don't know how you are, but there's nothing that thrills my soul anymore than new converts. Man, I thank God for that. I love that passion. I love that fire. I love that excitement. And, 
And though I'm not an old man, I, I want to say this as an, as an older Christian, it does my heart some good to be able to see that youth. And, and sometimes, because being honest, it's because we do kind of get complacent in our Christian walk. We don't like to admit that, but we see it. And it's like week after week, we see them going to the altar. We see them going to the altar. We see them going to the altar. And we think to ourselves, I remember when I was there. I remember when I was there. And then you begin to listen to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit says, why are you not still there? You begin to be convicted, and you're like, man, Lord, thank you for being so good to me. You get these mountaintop experiences where the Lord does the miraculous, just like he did when he fed the 5,000. I mean, he took five loaves and two fishes. I mean, praise God. It, it's amazing. It's amazing what the Lord had done. Can you imagine all the people then, the, their eyes were open to see who Jesus really was, his power, his authority. and Man, them disciples, can you imagine that day when they begin to see the Lord take that and, and just one after another? I mean, I'm talking about five loaves and two fishes, and surely they were thinking, how's he doing it? You say, how did he? I don't know how he did it. He's Jesus. He just made five loaves and two fishes keep working and working and working and working. If I'd have been sitting there, my heart would have been busting out of my chest because I've been thinking how in the world does he do it why because he's Jesus but then you come to that moment in your life and you know as well as I do and you go over to the book of Matthew later on in this chapter in these chapters actually in the book of Mark 2 where Jesus has took Peter and them up and they go up on the mountaintop and then they go back down in the valley the Christian life that we live it's like up in the mountain and down in the valley. And this is what I've learned. You don't get to choose where you live. God puts you in a certain place of your life. Sometimes he teaches you down in the valley. And what he teaches you in the valley, he can't teach you up on the mountaintop. But what he shows and reveals you on the mountaintop, he can't show you down in the valley. So God's classroom is all the time. But then you come to this place and you realize that though you've been on this mountaintop experience, and it's been good, thank God, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And I'm so excited for what the Lord is doing and he's going to continue to do. But I'm reminded that sometimes God's greatest lessons always comes after God's greatest blessings. And sometimes we get caught off guard by that. And then what happens is we get our mind and our eyes focused on things that are different. And we forget, listen to me, this is just God's way. This is how the Lord teaches us. What do you mean by that, Brother Jason? Well, you keep reading now. Remember, we're excited. The Lord has just done a great, great miracle and then you come down, if you will, and notice, if you will, let's start reading in verse number 22. The Bible says this. He says, in straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship to go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. So now all of a sudden you see the Lord begin to turn. They, they've seen a great miracle, but now he gives them a command and I don't know how you would be, but I would dare say these disciples were probably exhausted. You're going to get exhausted serving the Lord. And they were probably a little fatigued. They emotionally, physically both. I mean, if you know anything, when God begins to show up and do something like that, yes, physically, if you're laboring, serving over 5,000 people physically, you're going to be exhausted a bit emotionally. I mean, I'm going to be honest. When I come in here and spiritually the Lord meets with us, sometimes I leave out of here and emotionally, man, if you've been crying or something, worshiping the Lord, man, it drains you. These disciples were that way, not for a bad reason, but for a great reason they were that way. And then all of a sudden, this blessing now turns into a, a lesson. It's a lesson. They're going to learn something. And he says, I want you to get in the boat. I notice some things that's in this text. I want you just to read a few verses with me. Verse 23, let's pick up again. And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But... The ship was now in the midst of the sea, the disciples on it. Notice the words, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear, but straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. You stop there, now you want to see this is what the Lord is teaching. They went to something to where the Lord proved to them, watch now, the Lord proved to them that he could do anything. 
But the people that needed to be able to trust the Lord wasn't just the disciples. It was the people that were sitting down, trusting that if we sit down and obey what the Lord tells us to do, then the Lord will bless us and be good to us. But now the table is turned. Jesus told the disciples, I want you to be able to go get into the boat. And when they got in the boat, they went from a great miracle to a great storm. So they're sitting here and they're probably wondering, now wait a minute, why in the world are we here? And sometimes maybe you come to this place in your life, maybe you never do, but I will say this, you will eventually get here because God always teaches but the one thing that really stuck with me as I was reading this yesterday morning was this, is, is, is I wrote down in my journal, I keep a journal when I do my daily devotions, I kind of expositionally try to make my own commentary, and I don't ever recommend you to read it because it's probably not as deep as some of the other theologians that you know, but for me, I keep it for my, my family one day, and, and I wrote down the one thing that came off as soon as he said that, Brother Travis, was that that the presence of the Lord, though he went away to pray, he still remained right there with them. And I want to say this, when God begins to teach you something, sometimes the storm comes right after a great blessing. But you remember this, you still have the presence of the Lord. God is still going to be there. He will still be faithful to you no matter what he is teaching you. But it takes some things. I, I notice in verse number 22, you see what the Bible says, he told them to be able to get into the ship. That means you're going to have to continue to be able to follow the Lord. Even when it don't make sense and even when it seems like that, that you are exhausted and maybe things are making a turn in your eyes for the worse, you have to make up your mind. You're still going to be obedient to follow the Lord. When Jesus told the Peter and them, he says, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You know, as well as I do, that was not just one time. That was a continuation. That was a continual following. They, they had to be able to make up their mind every single day to keep following the Lord. If some of you have been saved for a short amount of time and a long amount of time, but at the end of the day, there is still the same principle that when we follow Jesus, it's not just when you get saved and that's it. No, it's every single day of your life, even if it is in the middle of a storm. So we got to keep following the Lord. So I would encourage you, whatever it is that God tells you to do, keep following Jesus. Just keep following Jesus. No matter what it is, just keep following Jesus. I want you to notice what the Bible says there in verse number 24. The Bible says that, of course, it said the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, and the wind was contrary. Listen, sometimes you're going to be faced with things. After being obedient to the Lord, you're going to be faced with some things that's going to seem like it's not fair. It's going to seem like it don't make no sense, but remember this, listen to me. His presence is still there. He's still going to be right there where he's able to be able to help you. I know that he went away to be able to pray, but he was there immediately. You're going to see in a moment where they didn't even recognize that it was Jesus. But here you're facing some of the greatest things. And every single day of our life, Jesus is coming back. Thank God for that. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. But the work is not done. It is not finished. There are still people that are lost, they're dying and going to hell. They need to be able to hear about a Savior. They need to be able to know about His unconditional love, about how He died for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And sometimes in your obedience to follow Jesus, you'll get up, you'll begin to start serving God. You'll start off in the month of January. Man, you're doing everything that you're supposed to do and you're going to immediately face something. You're saying, I was not ready for this. Notice what the Bible says. When they got there, the Bible says in verse number 26, it says, When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, Is it a spirit? They cried out for fear. You know what that means? That means they were confused. You know what I've learned? Sometimes God asks me to do some things and it leaves me confused. And sometimes I see some things and I'm like, I just, I just don't understand that. I don't understand why the Lord would let those people go through that or why the Lord's allowing them to face that. I don't know why the Lord's allowing me to be able to face that or the church to be able to face that. And, and listen to me, there, there, there's not a storm right now that I know of. There, there's a couple that you might not know of that's always lingering. That's always the case. But our church right now, I mean, God has been blessing. I mean, we've been seeing, I think we're in the midst of God feeding the 5,000 plus right now. I mean, it's been that good and I'm, I'm so grateful for that. But the season will change. Why? Because after God blesses, then there's sometimes where God is then going to teach us. 
And you had to be ready and willing to be able to listen to the Lord because the Lord is continuing to be able to teach us as we follow Him. It's not just a one-day thing and then it's done. No, we're going to have to keep following Him. So in the midst of that, we're going to face some things, we're going to see some things, but we've got to keep trusting the Lord. And not only that, even though we're confused, we've got to know, remember this, that it was the Lord that told us to get into this boat. You've got to remember that because that's key right there. I mean, it was the Lord that told us to get in this boat. Man, when you begin to serve the Lord, my wife and I was talking, I know many of you probably talk about the same thing, but man, you make commitments to the Lord, you start off in the month of January, and maybe it's a certain thing you do in your home, maybe it's a certain thing you do in your Bible reading, maybe it's when your mission's giving or whatever it may be, and, and you say, boy, I don't know if I can really make that happen, but wait a minute, it was the Lord that told you God will provide a way. Somebody say amen right there. It may seem to be confusing, but that's just because, watch me now, if it made sense, you'd be living by sight and not by faith. So you have to make your mind up. I'm not going to live by sight. It's not about what I see. It's just about trusting Jesus. I don't have to know everything. And thank God I don't because I don't have all the answers. But boy, I'm so thankful that God does and we can rest in Him and, and, and we can slow down. And, and sometimes we get so guilty to be able to tell somebody, well, let me give you a chapter and verse well, the truth be told, instead of giving a chapter and verse, sometimes we need to teach somebody how to just keep praying, even though they're facing a storm in their life. So here they face this. And, and then notice the Bible says there in, in verse 26, it says, and they cried out in fear. I mean, they were scared. Hey, can I tell you something? The things that God tells you to do, I, I, I never forget when I was uh, studying. I, I preached one time out of this text too, but um, many of you know the story of Moses. He turned around and he seen the snake, right? He was pick up the, and it turned into a serpent. And when he picked it up, it turned into a serpent. Anyway, it's, it's running and he's running around from the, he's running around from the snake. And he said, turn around, right? He told him to be able to turn around and grab it by the tail. You know what the Lord is trying to tell us? Sometimes we have to face our fears for him to teach us what he's trying to teach us. I, 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 I'm going to be honest, friend. I don't, I don't, I don't like snakes. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't care if it's a black snake. I don't care if it's a garden snake. I don't care if it's a toothless snake. It makes no difference. I don't like snakes. Can I get a witness right there? So I would have been doing the same thing that Moses. I'd have been running and running and running and running and running and running and running. But he told Moses to turn around and be able to grab that serpent by the tail. Brother Larry, that's because he's telling him, you got to have to face some things. You know why? Because he had to do in Moses, watch me now, he had to do in Moses what he was going to teach Moses to do with God's people. So sometimes God has to do something in you so God can do something through you. But if you don't ever turn around and face your fears, then you're going to be unusable. We pray, God, use me, use me, use me. But we're not usable. We're not usable. So here now, remember, his presence is still here. I like when he says here, notice if you will, he says... Verse 27, but straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. And all God's people said, Amen. Be not afraid. You know, that means you have the presence of the Lord. So when the tide changes and things happen in your life and the doctor gives new, 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 new news and, and things are beginning to, to transpire or unfold in front of you and you don't know what to do, let me just say this. Remember, the Lord is still with you. He's still with you. He's right there. Be of good cheer. It is I. It is I. It's not somebody. It's I. It's the Lord that's with you. You can trust the Lord. But not only did I see his presence in this, but I want you to see this. Sometimes when God calls us into these difficult situations, watch me now, there's also a great privilege. And this is not an outline. These, this is, I wrote this on a little piece of paper here. As I have the past couple of days, it's, it's, a, it's a privilege I'm going to say this to you. A lot of us carry battles, but can I say this? The Lord chose you to fight that battle. God chose David to fight Goliath. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? It's the Lord that chooses you to face whatever it is that you're about to face. God makes no mistakes. He makes no mistakes. He knows what he's doing. He knows when you and your family can face something and can get through it. He knows what he can give you and he knows what he can do through you. And at the end of the day, he will get the glory if you will just be submissive and trust the Lord every step of the way. What do you mean by that, Brother Jason? Notice what the text says, verse number 28. And Peter, there he is. 
You know who Peter is, the one who always wants to talk. He answered him and said, Lord, watch this now. If it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, notice these words, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. You notice that? Notice verse number 30. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and he beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. To go back to verse number 28, notice right there what he says. He said, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come out. Do you understand that was a privilege? That was a privilege for him to be closer to the Lord than everybody else was. Geographically, he was closer to the Lord. He was walking closer to the Lord. He was getting ready to experience something that nobody else had ever experienced. Can I just stop for a second and say, there's about every one of us to all say hallelujah right there because there's been a dark, deep place in your life that nobody's ever been to where you've been and you said this. Nobody understands what I'm going through. Nobody knows how I feel. Nobody understands the pain, the fear. Nobody understands how I am. Whether it be a, a sickness, whether it be a trial, whether it be affliction, whether somebody's hurt you, whether the Lord's took a spouse from you. Listen, we always say these things that the Lord does or nobody knows how I feel. But can I tell you something? This is an opportunity for the Lord to do something through you. And literally, God is allowing you to learn something of him that nobody else may ever know it's a privilege that you get to do that it's a testimony can you imagine Peter giving his testimony <laughs> I walked on water we still talk about what Peter did and the problem is we complain when we get the Peter moments of our mo of our life when we're the ones that's out there, when we're the ones that's, that, that's experienced these difficulties, we complain about it. And I understand we always complain about it sometimes. But remember, it is a privilege that God allows us to be able to do what we're doing. I love how he says it. He says, he says Lord, notice what he says. He says, Bimmy. In other words, I want to be able to be closer to you. I want to be closer to you. You ever think sometimes the reason why the Lord allows us to be able to go through some things in our life is because he wants us to be closer to him? You ever thought about that? He, he, wants, he wants us to want to draw ourselves closer to Him. It's, it's not to discourage us. Watch me now. It's not to come to church like a victim and, and like everything is bad happening in your life. No, that's not the case. He just literally wants you to be able to, to want that relationship with Him. And sometimes that's what the Lord has to do. He has to bring a storm in your life for you to be willing to get out the boat. Be like, man, I'd rather be with Jesus than be with the boat. Somebody say amen right there. You say, that don't make sense. I know sometimes things don't make sense. When you do things with Jesus, it don't always make sense to the world. But you're better off being closer to Jesus than you are in your safe boat. Somebody say amen. You understand what I'm saying right there? You notice what the Lord says. I like this. He gives him that invitation. You know what he said? He says, come. He says, come. You know, we always ask the Lord to use us. So many people stand up in the church, they testify. I go back to when I first got saved. The man I remember, Dale Mitchell, when he'd get up and testify. I remember before he had died, and he talked about how the Lord would use them, and they taught all those classes and done all the, so many different things with children and stuff like that. Me and Brother Archie would give me so many different things. And man, he talked about how the Lord had used him and he went overseas and man, he'd served God. And I remember Brother Bobby standing up and talking about how God had changed his life. And I, I, I used to always say, Lord, I want a testimony like theirs. I want a testimony like theirs. I never forget Ken Bowman. One time I was down in North Augusta and he was preaching. He was at a camp meeting and but Larry Walker, understand this. Some of you who's ever been in a camp meeting, you understand a lot of times a lot of preacher boys would be around there. Of course, they was all sitting around there, and he was sitting there. And as he was sitting there, he, he opened up his Bible and just kind of out of his Bible, his message fell out of his Bible just like so. The young preacher boy picked it up, and he said, boy, I got me something to preach now, just as any other preacher boy would. Of course, falling out of a man of God's Bible like that. And he wasn't saying it to be sarcastic. He wasn't being rude and disrespectful. 
But the words that Brother Ken Bowman gave him was probably some of the most profound words you could ever give. He said, son, you don't want to pay the price I had to pay for God to give me that message. And what I'm trying to say is God does something supernatural in your life that you can say, me and God, why? Because he said, come. You wanted, you wanted that of the Lord and he gives you that invitation. It's a privilege. He says, Come. And you get the chance to be able to be right there and learn something of him. Can I say this? I, I can preach about God's grace now because I've experienced God's grace. I, I can preach about forgiveness because I've had to learn how to continue to forgive. I can preach about mercy because I've had to learn about the mercy. I, I, I mean, I can preach about these things because the Lord had to teach me about these things. When I first got saved and got born again, got married, I can come to church and preach about a marriage, and that's fine and dandy, but I didn't know a lot about marriage, but I, I, I don't have a lot like a lot of you, but I, I got some that I could talk about some things that we've learned. And it ain't about the negative, it's about what God showed and revealed to us and those, those storms of our life. Can y'all help me right there? I mean, some of them tough moments of your life. And I think back where some people didn't make, I mean, you think about Brother Larry, we say, God, why would you let Brother Larry and Miss Shelby go through the things they've been through? I don't know, but I know this. They can come back now and talk about how good God's been. They got a testimony nobody else does. I've seen the same thing happen Miss Kathy Southern. And listen, she might not be able to talk a lot about it unless she can talk a little bit about being sedated during that time. But I remember when the men would go and I went with Brother Larry and Preacher and all of them. And I can tell you this, and Brother Lloyd can probably stand up and he ain't going to talk about nothing, no disrespect, but nothing about the church. He ain't going to talk about nothing about uh, finances. He, he can probably not talk about anything about the war. But he could tell you a long story about when God answered prayer, when his wife was on her deathbed. They didn't think that she was going to make it. And it might not mean nothing to nobody else, but you let another husband go through this one day whenever their wife is sitting there and they got no hope and it seems like everything is gone. Man, we go back through all these things. It's a testimony. And listen, no, we, we, we would not want to relive it. You understand that? I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. The, the flesh does not want to relive those moments. But listen, haven't you learned how sweet the Lord is and how faithful the Lord is in some of these moments? I talk to Miss Anders and Miss Imogene sometimes and some of the others. After the Lord took someone and not just them, I mean, Miss Nancy, I remember, I mean, I can go around the room with widows and widowers. And I hear those words you just don't understand. And you're right, Brother Larry, I don't understand. I don't understand what they've been through. But I know this, I, I, and I'm just being honest with you. Out of all the years that Miss Imogene has poured in the ladies and, and Miss Anders and all those others, listen, I imagine somewhere down the line, after the Lord took Brother Clegg, Miss Anders could turn around and pour back into Miss Imogene. You understand what I'm saying? The Lord, the Lord gives you a privilege. He gives you a privilege. And there's some hard things sometimes that we go through, but it's not... It's got nothing to do with a defeat. It's definitely not because the Lord's going to drown us. Somebody say amen. I mean, the Lord's not going to drown us. So you see this privilege. Let's keep on going. I'll I give you a couple more things. Notice this. There's a protection that's there. I like this right here. But when he saw, that means when he got his eyes off the Lord and he began to start living by sight, not by faith, okay? He started being led by emotions. Notice what happened. The wind was boisterous when he realized just how difficult the situation was. Notice this. He was afraid. Can I say this to you? When you ask questions, listen to me. This is what the Lord told me yesterday morning. When you ask questions, quit answering your questions. Keep asking God, let him answer them for you. Because when you see the wind blowing, you're like, Lord, I, I don't understand. And before you know it, you're going to get frustrated. And you're going to try, well, I'm probably dealing with this because of such and such. Well, maybe because the Lord's done with me, or maybe he don't want me to do this anymore. Maybe God's trying to be able to move this, or God's trying to be able to maneuver me, or maybe God's trying to, no, listen, quit answering your questions. Just keep walking with the Lord and talking to the Lord, because if you keep answering your own questions, you're going to get defeated very quick. And then notice what happens. The Bible says, beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. But you know what happened? As soon as he did, the Lord what? He reached out his hand. He helped him. The Lord was right there. Not one time. You want to know why? Because the presence of the Lord is still there. And you're going to get in these situations and there's still a protection that's there. God is still faithful. God knows. He, he knows when, whenever you begin to fall. He knows when you change your focus. He knows. He knows. He knows. 
He knows when you're in this situation, you begin to be overwhelmed and you, you cannot settle down. He, he knows, he sees it in you. But that's when he says, come unto me, all you labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke, it's my yoke, it's my yoke, it's my yoke. Lord, you lead me, you lead me. Whatever it is that you want, Lord, you lead me. I'm going to learn of you. When you get out of that storm, you know what, you know what Peter's going to say? Yeah, I got my eyes off of Jesus, but the Lord was right there to help me. The Lord was right there. He, not, not the disciples. Not, it was the Lord that was right there to help him. Why? Because he protects us. He keeps us. He's faithful. Notice what the Bible says in verse number 31. I love this. Notice this. He says, and immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. He caught him. I tell you this, you're never out of the reach of God. You're never out of the reach of God. You're saved, born again, neither shall any man ever pluck them out of my hand. You're never, you, you, God has got you covered, you're taken care of. You don't believe that? Go back to the book of Job. Satan had to literally go to, he had to go to God. Ask for permission. Can, can I come after Job? And Job went through it. He said, well, let me attack his body. I'm paraphrasing. Let me attack his body. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says when you come to chapter number 2, he said it very plain. He said that he still keep his, he held, hold fast his integrity. Job never changed. He never changed. He, listen, you go on down, you ask his wife what happened. She says, do, do you still keep or remain to thine integrity? In other words, even his wife said, Job, are you still going to worship the Lord? Yes, because I know that God's got it taken care of. You don't know why when the storm came in his life, listen to me, do you know why he had that? Because in, in, verse, in chapter number one, he said, he said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. He knew who gives and he knows who takes away. And he said this, blessed be the name of the Lord. So if the Lord gives, blessed be the name of the Lord. If the Lord takes, blessed be the name of the Lord. He says, naked came out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. So in other words, he's saying, listen, everything that's in order in life, it's in God's order. It's not the devil who is making this happen in my life. Are you listening? It's not the devil. It's not Satan. Now, Satan's not in control. God is in control. So blessed be the name of the Lord. So when you come to chapter number two, you better believe he still holds fast his integrity. Because God is still the same. God is still faithful. And he knows God's never moved. God's never turned back. So that's the same thing right here. You see the protecting hand of God. I don't know who this is for. Maybe it's just me. I, man, it's been on me the past two days. Let me give you this last thing. I want to show you this right here. Verse number 32. The Bible says, and when they come into the ship, matter of fact, let me, let me finish verse 31. I can't, I can't change the words of Christ. I can't skip them. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and called him and said unto him, notice this, here's what it's all about. Here's the lesson. Here's the lesson. You ready? O thou little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Look here, you don't see, watch me now. You see me perform a miracle for them and you don't think I can do it for you? I mean, you just, you're going to get out there and, 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 and take your eyes and start looking how bad it is. And all of a sudden, you're just going to start sinking. Why? It, it, it's okay. You believe me when I'm blessing everybody else. But do you trust me to bless you and be good to you? Even in the bad and the good, do you, do you trust that all things work together for the, Do you really believe that? Oh, thou little faith. And if we're honest tonight, that's exactly what the Lord always does. He increases our faith, he increases our faith, he increases our faith, he increases our faith, he increases our faith. You say, how in the world does that happen? I don't know. But I know this, every time I turn around, he's still faithful, he's still faithful, he's still faithful. Man, I go back to every year being saved, every year pastor, and every year being married. He's still faithful. Times when we're in the, in, 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 in the bottom of the barrel, he's still faithful. When we, didn't, when we didn't have our finances right, when we didn't know how to keep our finances right, he's still faithful. Amen. When I messed up, he's still faithful. I mean, I'm telling you, every single time, he's still faithful. That my faith is in Christ and Christ. It's not in the church. I love the church. 
The church is important to me tonight because Christ died for the church and he instituted the local church because that is the New Testament process of how the Lord reaches and disciples sinners. They get saved, get born again. Christians then turn around. We duplicate ourselves. We turn around. We go out and we reach somebody else. That, that, that's why the local church matters. But my faith is not in the church. The church is not perfect. The church is not faithful. It messes up. But God is. So because he's faithful, listen, I'm going to trust that in every storm that he allows in this place, he's still God and he's still going to take care of it. So we say, Lord, I, I don't understand. We begin to see, you know, what's going to happen. Immediately he's going to stretch forth his hand. Why? Because I say, I say it all the time. The end of you is the beginning of God. When Peter said, I can't, he's going under. Jesus says, but I can. He's got it. That's the key to it. That's the key right there. The Lord knows exactly what he's doing. And then when you get up there, he says, he says you did, I'm paraphrasing, you didn't believe me? Is your, faith, is your faith that thin that I could feed all those people over, those 5,000 men plus all the children who went, I could do all of that. And you believe, you believe once I've seen it, hallelujah. But after you've seen that miracle, you don't think I'm able to be able to take care of you. Let me give you this, and I'm done. Verse number 32, I'm finished. And when they came into the ship, watch this now. The wind ceased. And they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Oh, I mean, of a, of a truth, thou art the Son of God. So there was a confirmation. Somebody comes to the piano tonight, and I want you to notice this. The power that was there, it calmed their heart. They sing that song, When Jesus Speaks Peace. Boy, I love that song. There's a lot of things in this life that will make you uneasy, uncomfortable, make you tap into your flesh, begin to respond by the flesh. And watch me now, sometimes God's greatest lessons always come after God's greatest blessings. He just blessed all of those people. And you come up there and you're like, Lord, do you know what you're doing? Yes, he knows what he's doing because here's what he's doing. He's strengthening your faith because of what he's getting ready to do through you in the next stage of your life. Are you understanding what I'm saying to you? And that calm that he gives right there, literally the Bible says that the wind just ceased. I, I haven't been there. I, of course, I'm going to be able to go in a couple of weeks. But they say when you get over there in Israel, you're able to be able to look out there on those seas. And what you don't realize, it's not like the Atlantic Ocean. They said it literally, you, you can see the other side. You say, what's that got to do with anything? Well, when we get on the Atlantic Ocean, we travel out miles. We don't see a storm coming, right? But when the Lord told them disciples, let's get on that boat. We're going to go over to the other side. They probably looked over there and said, oh, everything's all right. They got on that boat. And then they got out a little ways and out of nowhere. You ever happen like that in your life? Out of nowhere, storm comes. You don't know why? Because God... Is just trying to teach us, strengthen us. And tonight, if you're here, listen, I just want to say this, and I'm, I'm done again. Thank you for listening to my devotion as I walk with the Lord. <laughs> but we serve a faithful God. He's good all the time. And I'm going to be honest, I'm old Peter. I, I, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not going to judge Peter. I don't, you'll never hear me talk bad about Peter. You don't know why? Because I can't tell you how many times I've been out there, thought I was walking, and I begin to sink. Got that high step going on. Y'all ever do that in life? You're like, man, everything's good. Praise God. <laughs> All of a sudden, like, boy, I ain't got as much as I thought I had it. Walking like the Jeffersons when you walk, starting off, right? Then before you get done, you're walking like Fred Sanford. That's a big Vegeta. <laughs> I done lost half of you right there. You all right? <laughs> Amen. 
For the record, I don't know if that was spiritual. I was a kid, but I used to watch it. Amen. <laughs> we serve a good God. I just, I want to remind you, we serve a good God. And I want to tell you, listen, enjoy, enjoy the 5,000 plus being fed. But remember this, when the storms come in your life, in your home, in the church, remember this, embrace the storm. If Jesus said it's because there's a reason. The same way, watch me now, the same way he told those people to sit down to receive their blessing, it was just as important and crucial as he told them to get on the boat to be able to, get, to go on because he was going to teach them both something. They was going to see who he really was. If obedience works for them, it works for us. Everything in the walk with God, it always requires obedience, obedience, obedience. And I want to say this to you. I know that sometimes... Emotionally, we get stirred and we think, ah, this is what I need to do. Just continue to stay faithful with the Lord. Let the Lord guide and mold you. And remember this, that God's always teaching that your faith may increase. That you'll know He is who He said He is. Amen. Stand your feet, heads bowed, eyes closed. Heaven. It is a joy and a privilege to be able to know that you've tuned in. And I pray that today that the word of God that was shared will be a blessing to you. If somehow, some way that the Lord has spoke to your heart and maybe you're uh, sitting where you are and you don't know for sure that you're saved by the grace of God and you've ever trusted Jesus Christ as a personal savior, then I want you to know that the word of God says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible makes it very plain, for the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You say, how do I get saved? You have to trust in Christ and Christ alone. Repent of your sin and then know as the Bible says where Jesus says, I am the way. And I pray that today that that would be your desire to be able to seek out for the Lord Jesus Christ, to be able to trust him as a Lord and Savior. If you do that today and you repent of your sins and you take him as your Savior, would you do us a favor and contact our church office at 336-788-0551? We would love to be able to speak with you. We would love to be able to encourage you, maybe be able to help you find a local church no matter where you are today, and maybe even possibly disciple you. So we want to say thank you so much, and we are definitely going to be praying for you and this ministry that our church has. If you know you're saved, and maybe the Lord spoke to you in a different way, and there's something heavy on your heart, Again, that same number, if you can contact us, we'll be so thankful to be able to reach out, be able to speak with you. But again, on behalf of the church and myself, thank you so much and may God bless you.